Hey, do you want to go power motoring? This may not be the typical way an IT conversation starts, but it just might be the way you begin an interaction with Richard Socher, especially if you're near a beautiful vista or in any gorgeous outdoor setting. But power motoring is only Richard's hobby. His job is chief scientist for Salesforce. As the chief scientist, Richard wears a couple of different hats. He and his team focus on publishing new research data, doing applied research, incubating, and working on all the capabilities of the Salesforce platform. The type of work Richard and his team do extends across many fields, but lately they have been narrowing in on AI and all things Salesforce Einstein voice assistant. On this episode of IT Visionaries, Richard talks about his origins, including the work he did as the founder, CEO, and CTO of Metamind, the current and future state of affairs of AI and voice, and yes, his love of paramotoring. Enjoy this episode. IT Visionaries is created by the team at mission.org and brought to you by the Salesforce Customer 360 platform. This episode is part of a special series on the Salesforce Customer 360 platform, the platform that powers the world's number one CRM. In this series, executives from Salesforce will discuss how using 10 innovative technologies, including AI, blockchain, and automation, can help you drive the digital transformation of every experience and get you closer to your customers. Welcome to another episode of IT Visionaries. I'm Ian Faison, Chief Content Officer here at Mission.org. And we have in studio, Richard, what's going on? Aloha. Uh, lots going on. Where to start? Yeah, where to start indeed. Let's, let's start before we get into your role as Chief Scientist at Salesforce. How did you get started in technology in the first place? Oh boy, uh, I guess that started pretty much in high school. I loved uh, math and languages and they really... Uh, come together in computers, where you try to use math to describe a lot of different things, including such complicated human uh, inventions uh, as language. And then uh, studied linguistic computer science in college, and then discovered in my master's in 2006, what we then called statistical machine learning, and fell in love with it and thought this was obviously the future for all the things. And eventually that became just machine learning. And then more and more people uh, had a broader scope for the field and started bringing back the term artificial intelligence. And uh, yeah, that's, that's how I got into it. Is it true that you have over 40 patents or at 40 patents? Oh, yeah. It's probably already an old number. We already have a bunch more. Yeah, our group is very productive. When you were... Finishing up after Stanford, you founded a company called Metamine, right? That's right. So tell me about the company. So at the time, I was really excited about artificial intelligence. And you know that was sort of what my PhD was about. And during my PhD, I had a couple of companies reach out to me and ask whether I could work for them. And originally, I actually was on F1 student visa, so I couldn't. But then I got my green card during the PhD and was able to do a little bit of consulting. And I, I noticed how... These different companies ask me to do these different things, but there's clearly a, some underlying technology there that is very common and that we could actually, if we built a good platform for, uh, make useful for a lot of different companies. And it felt a lot more meaningful to try to build that platform uh, that would empower a lot of other companies that aren't the likes of you know, Google and Facebook and Amazon and have multi-billion dollar R&D budgets and make AI accessible for, for everybody. And that was the idea, the original idea of MetaMind. Uh, but then, of course, you, as you go in, uh, you have to realize you really need three different ingredients to make AI successful in a company or for a product, whether it's a startup or larger enterprise uh, company. And those three things are data, algorithms, and, and deep understanding of the workflow and in the industry that you want to tackle with AI. And so in the startup, we're really good at the algorithms. Yeah but not really the other two. <laughs> so why why do you feel like this was so important? Is it like to democratize that so that everyone can use it? Like, why was that important to you? So a couple of reasons. I think AI as a field is probably the most exciting field right now for humanity, partly because it captures the whole spectrum from on the one extreme telling us who we are as a species. Because by, by and large, we define ourselves through intelligence. We're not as kind to other animals that we deem a lot less intelligent than us. And defining intelligence tells us a little bit about ourselves, uh, what we mean by intelligence, and then you know, having a constructive approach to intelligence, being able to build it makes us understand it better. And that has led to, for instance, in the beginning, people thought 
playing chess. The smartest people play chess. So if we can play chess well, then everything else will kind of follow and we'll we'll do other things in AI. Yeah. But it turned out it's much harder to just walk and get the mail than to play chess for computers. And so it told us a lot about our intelligence. Uh, and so that's one side of the extreme. And the other side is it just makes a lot of money. It's very useful. It can make our lives simpler. It allows us to get rid of most repetitive tasks that aren't that exciting to do in, in retrospective and everything in between. And so AI as a field is, is fascinating for that reason. And then when, you, when you're when you that excited about a field, and I was excited about it when it was still much more abstract and fewer people in the world had sort of woken up to the fact that AI will have an influence and change pretty much every industry that's out there. But then when you actually when the rubber hits the road, so to say, and you really want to use it, it turns out it's much, sometimes better to have a service that companies can pay for than to throw some open source software over the fence. And then companies just don't know how to actually use it. And so I thought it was very, uh, at the time, I thought it would be a great idea to try to lower the entry barrier. And we made it as easy as just drag and drop files into the web browser, and then you can have a trained AI. And now, of course, we also want to think about actually having positive applications of AI. Yeah, so let's talk about some of those positive applications, because I think sometimes, like you say, kind of people focus on maybe the negative or the, the other side of that, but there's an extremely large amount of things that we haven't even come close to tapping into yet. What are some of those examples that you've seen? Yeah, so so I'm I, I don't want to sweep the negative effects of AI completely under the rug. I think they're important to talk about, and and, and we'll get there. Don't <laughs> worry. <laughs> uh, and I think for the most part, AI is omni-use technology. You can really use it for anything. It's like a hammer. You can use a hammer as a weapon or to build a house. It's like the internet. Uh, you can use the internet to share nice Wikipedia and factual information or to spread this information. So AI is only as good as the people, the organizations, the legislative and infrastructure and so on that it's, that it's embedded in. And as such, uh, we do need to think a lot about what the positive applications are. And then if we work on those, I think the net positive will be there. And so there are a lot of positive applications in agriculture, uh, where we can automate, for instance, fruit picking. Turns out actually over 20% of all fruit are not picked in the United States because nobody wants to actually pick them. It's not a particularly fun job uh, in the sun and the fields. And and that you know leads to food waste and so on. And I think in retrospect, we'll see similar things to what we saw in the previous industrial revolution, where there might be jobs now that people do say, well, I don't mind driving a truck. Truck driving is, is a fun fun job for some. But when you look back and now say, well, of the jobs that have been automated in the last 100 years, would you want to go back and start doing those? People would be like, why would I do the work of a tractor? A tractor is so much more efficient than people standing in the field doing manual labor. And so in retrospect, most people wouldn't want to go back because over 150 years ago, over 90% of people worked in agriculture. And back then, if you asked them, imagine agriculture is mostly automated by some big machine. What would you do? They're like, well, what else is there to do? We need food, we need shelter, and once we have both, there's nothing else to do. And now everybody wants an iPad and wants to drive, you know, like a Tesla or some other fun car or something. There are lots of new things that people come up with, and that is my hunch on sort of the the long term perspective uh, yeah. of this. You know, we talk all the time on the show about like the idea that um, you know there's this revolutionary new technology. Uh, we need a technology that gets rid of flies because there's flies in the studio right now. Um, but there's this you know revolutionary new technology. And it was a little bit dangerous and people didn't really understand it. Uh, and it was going to take away jobs. And the jobs it was going to take was the lamplighters and that was electricity, right? It's like that sort of thing. It's no, there's no lamplighters anymore. And yet we worry about the other ones that are kind of going on. And it's not and it's not that it sh you shouldn't be worried about those things because do, yeah. you should. Like we should be worried about how to upskill people that are in those careers that are going to get uh, you know, augmented in some way. Absolutely. And have the socially social safety nets and so on infrastructure to help people. So we can we can get to that. I'll, I want to get back to your yeah. previous question, which is uh, which I really love, all the other positive applications. So agriculture is one. Another really obvious one that we're very excited about and actually just hired uh, Andre Estevar, head of medical AI, and have, have done uh, a couple of other projects already in this space is medicine. Yeah. Uh, most people would agree that they wouldn't want to create more jobs in medicine. They want to create more healthy people cheaply, effectively, quickly. And doctors are getting bogged down with a lot of busy work 
that they definitely don't want to do, like scribing conversations, putting in medical codes, things like that. AI can help a lot with, so doctors can actually focus on tough cases and think about and talk to their patients and have that empathy and, and sympathy with their patients and spend time again with them rather than filling out forms and things like that. And so at the same time, there are a lot of medical capabilities that aren't available in a lot of places. So Africa, for instance, has very few pediatric radiologists. Uh, I think some estimates go in like a handful in all of Africa that have a specialization in, in radiology for children. And so there are a lot of cases where you would love to be able to take the information and knowledge from the best radiologists or pathologists or other uh, doctors and oncologists especially, and infuse that knowledge through training data into an AI so that a lot of other people could benefit from it. Uh, so we work in pathology, for instance, uh, identifying different breast cancer types from, from uh, samples and, and a lot of other projects in that space. And so I'm really excited about that. And then, of course, we want to talk also about our main job, which is that of CRM, sales, service, and marketing. And while you might say, well, medicine feels like even more obviously good, I think overall, a lot of companies struggle with providing good service. They want to be close to their customers. And it's also helpful for them to be able to focus more on the customer by automating certain parts of that conversation. For instance, we just released Einstein Voice Assistant. Turns out not everybody in the world can have an assistant. We'd need twice the people and then, of course, twice the people again and so on. Um, so uh, it would be great if people didn't have to, after each meeting, go back on their computers and type up all the things that yep. were important. Uh, instead, with Einstein Voice Assistant, which we've released and are currently in a beta and will will open up to everybody in a couple months, everybody will have the ability to walk out of a meeting and just dictate all the meeting notes as they walk out, we do all the speech recognition for them, we do natural language understanding, and then we update the CRM database. And that's a very concrete feature that will just make people's work life much simpler. Yeah, I want to get into, uh, I wanted to get deep into the voice voice piece of this, because we've had a lot of folks on talking about, you know, the impact of what voice could do for the business. But I want to hear more about specifically, like how you how you kind of see this. But I want to take a step back for a second. So what does the chief scientist do at Salesforce? It has evolved over the last couple of years uh, that I've been in this role. Uh, at this point, uh, I have I wear a couple of different hats and we have a couple of different groups inside the company. Uh, we have a, a pure research group, uh, science, where we really try to publish and push uh, the state of the art in artificial intelligence forward at the top conferences in the field, like International Conference on Machine Learning or Neural Information Processing Systems, NeurIPS and ICML uh, and others. And that is that is one aspect. Uh, but then we also have a group for applied research uh, that actually works on problems that we know uh, we can solve, but you can always solve them slightly better or be more focused on CRM or enterprise software applications. So for instance, work on machine translation. Mostly machine translation works reasonably well, but we can actually focus the translation on, for instance, uh, documentation that we are legally required to provide. And in that, you have certain terminology, for instance, that if you just use an off-the-shelf translation software, it might mess up a translation. It might translate Salesforce as, you know, into German or, or Japanese or something as the force of the sale or something, when really you need to just keep that phrase intact. And so... These are examples where we can infuse and focus on AI for CRM and still do some research uh, that pushes that field forward. And then that's the second part. And uh, the third part is the really exciting aspect of incubation, creating new products that are maybe a year or two years out rather than a quarter or two quarters yeah. out. And uh, incubating new products that are to a large degree dependent on AI actually working reasonably well. So the Einstein Voice Assistant I just mentioned is an example of that, where we actually were able to create that, even though it wasn't a few customers asked. Sometimes, you know, there's this sort of fun fake quote from Ford when you ask them, when he asked people what they want, they said faster horses, yeah. right? But you like, you know, sometimes you have to have an idea. And it's really important to be close to your customer and ask your customer what they want. But sometimes it's also good to have a vision and then build it in, if you believe it's such an obvious improvement in the workflow of people. And so this Einstein Voice Assistant was one of those where we, of course, worked with focus groups once we had uh, prototypes, 
But uh, we really thought this would be a vision that would make a data entry a lot more efficient for all our customers. And so that was one uh, great example from the incubation team. And then the fourth team is the platform team uh, where we identified a bunch of capabilities similar to actually to MetaMind, my startup, that were needed across the company. So for instance, text classification or image classification are use cases that come up in all the different cloud sales service marketing. And so we provide a centralized AI service that serves different kinds of models. Customers, external customers can train their own models, but can also internal teams can also train their own models and infuse AI into their different products. And that platform powers uh, not just the Einstein Voice Assistant, the things we incubate, but also features of other clouds like the chatbots that yeah. we have in Service Cloud. So when, and I'm so curious about voice because, I mean, it's it's so clearly like here for, you know, every single sales rep of the future is going to have this. Like it's so obvious, but, you know, not too long ago, every single sales rep was, you know, having to manually record their calls into Salesforce, you know, or having to manually update emails in Salesforce. And like now all those things, you just, you know, like the brand new sales rep that just graduated from whatever, you know, SDR or whatever, doesn't have to deal with any of that. How quickly is voice going to be the new normal? I think it's it's something that we're thinking a lot about. You'll, you'll hear a lot about it in a couple of weeks at Dreamforce. Uh, we'll have some really fun announcements. Uh, wish I could share them with you right now. Really, really stoked about them. Uh, but it's clear to us and to many people that voice is a very natural way to interact with you. And it's a natural way that customers interact with your company. Right? So I think if you call in the next couple of years, your bank or your insurance company, there is an old way of dealing with that, which is you either wait, uh, listen to jazz music for 10, 15 minutes before you get a really qualified rep, or you would have to work your way through an IVR system where you press, you know, one, if you want to talk to these people and two, if you want to press and you have to hear these menus forever and then sort of go through a large uh, menu tree. But I think the future will be a combination of that experience, those experiences. And instead you can just say what you want and you might not necessarily talk to a person right away, but the AI might actually solve your problem while you're potentially waiting for a person and you might not even have to talk to a person anymore. And so the capabilities that you can automate on the service side, I think will increase over the next couple of years. And that is just a very natural interaction to solve things. Now, I think some on some level people were almost too excited. I'm very excited about voice, but there are there are still use cases where it is really nice to have an interface. For instance, anything that involves a long list, like a list of hotels. You don't want to have to sit there and say, hotel number one is 0.3 miles yeah. from the city center and it has four out of five stars and it costs, and then hear that 20 times, right? You just want to see a picture, see it on a map, and there are still good uses uh, for visual interfaces. And sometimes a relationship to uh, voice interfaces too. Like you can see how you might ask a voice assistant a question and then they will give you a presentation that is visually stimulating and exciting about you know the numbers with the right kinds of plots and graphs and so on to make the data come alive for your answer. So we're also working actually, one of the fun research papers uh, that we published in the last couple of years is uh, on translating natural language English questions into SQL queries. Wow. So it's uh, in some ways it's just like translation, but the output here is a very structured form that is actually, that enables people to interact with their data in a much more natural way. And that, again, can be connected to voice, of course, so that people can just make use of their data much more quickly. So it's the both we see voice as important for both our customers as they interact with the CRM, but also for our customers' customers as they interact with, you know, the brands like Adidas or, or a large company. Yeah, because you've mentioned in the past that, like, each company has its own, like, lingo and private data, and they want to have control of their vocabulary and speech recognition and things like that, you know, like... We all of our producers always joke because class name is Phase On, but it spells out Phase On in every single mm -hmm. one of our translations that we do, like things like that, where you know you want it to be personalized to you. How much is personalization part of this? That's a big part, and personalization and uh, privacy and trust are big reasons of why we decided to 
both partner, but also build our own speech recognition system. Because yeah. we see that there are certain CRM use cases in sales service, to some degree also in marketing, but especially in sales and service, where you want your data to never be part of a public larger model. And that is sort of the de facto default for consumer uh, speech APIs, where you know, in some cases, not even out of any attempt at undermining privacy, but just to try to make the service better, large consumer companies would ask people to annotate their data and make sure they're still doing it correctly and add new vocabulary and so on. But it also means that some random people might hear in your conversation or a fully automated AI system might actually learn from the speech that it hears how to autocomplete. And so that can lead to some odd things where if you talk to large consumer speech API, it picks up all the things you say. So if you're a bank and you talk about uh, some mergers and potential acquisitions, and then the AI will autocomplete, you say, oh, company X acquires mumble, mumble, mumble. Yeah. And then it'll just autocomplete that mumble to the Y, the company that you know you talked a lot about wanting to acquire, or there's some big process going on. And so that, of course, a non-starter for, for banks and, and companies and industries like medicine too, where, where privacy is really, really important. And so we developed our own speech system to support banks that have already said, we'll only use your voice if it's completely trusted. There's zero data sharing across any organizations outside of ours. And so that is part of it. And then, of course, <clears throat> yeah, like, like you said already, companies have their own terminology. Srinivas Talapragada is uh, our president of all of technology, uh, my my great boss. And you know, that term and his his name is not that common. And so it'll probably also get butchered by, by a speech recognition system and not correctly transcribed. And so we want to be able to allow companies to add their own terminology and say, these are words that we care about. And if in doubt, it's probably one of these rather than something completely different. What are some of the use cases that have surprised you that you didn't think would be as like far along as they are potentially? I think the ability to have voice conversations over the phone is pretty surprising. And I did not think that would that could come as quickly as as I think it will now. Do you mean like with mobile or yeah, just take like pick any phone number and call, take a call and actually have a back and forth conversation in a dialogue system. That is that is pretty amazing that we we got that to a reasonable degree. Uh, and for you know, still small use cases and small domains, but uh, I think we're we're approaching it now in a much more scalable fashion, such that I can see in the next couple of years, maybe most five, maybe much less for some organizations, uh, we could automate and automatically answer somewhere between five to eighty percent of all the incoming service questions. Wow. And whether it's five or eighty really depends on what kind of organization you're in, right? If you have a lot of technical, questions that are, oh, I have this operating system and this database uh, version, and now I get this random error message every time you know these th five things align, AI yeah, will probably not be able to automatically answer that right away over the phone. But if you're you know, a food delivery service, and mostly it's people are like, my food came cold, I want a different one, or I don't like it anymore, or something like, you have a lot more ability to automatically answer that and you have a much larger volume and the cost per transaction is high given how much revenue you get from each transaction. So you'll see different industries really benefit from that technology more so than others. I want to talk about customers a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the CIOs that are listening have two sets of customers, right? They have their internal stakeholders and then their you know external, their actual customers. How do you kind of look at that kind of like internal versus external with voice? Because there's so many things that, you know, CIOs are trying to automate internally that are trying to figure out how to, how to change, how to speed up processes, uh, how to empower employees. But then, you know, conversely, a lot of them are talking to customers every day and need to figure out that piece too. It is a, something that we as a company actually think a lot about. We, we call it B2B and B2B2C. Yeah. Um, and... In the examples I already brought up, we had both, right? So the Einstein voice assistant is mostly for the CRM users to make the work of uh, salespeople more efficient and spend less time sitting there doing data entry into the CRM. And the ability to have conversations or service chats that you can already have over websites, over texts, 
with customers of our customers uh, and users or consumers, we also want to empower those capabilities. So we do really think about both. You know, with the rise of, and, uh, you know, truly the, the rebranding of the customer 360 platform, I, I always think about this, you know, the idea of voice as like, for your customer, it's like the most potential annoying piece of like, everybody just gets on the phone and then they either hit zero or they say representative, right? Because like nobody wants to deal with the automated thing. It's actually gotten worse. Like yeah. it was better when we just had human beings yeah. answering the phones. Yeah. Um, and that a lot of people say, oh, if I had an AI or human, I would take the human. Of course, if that's the option, just to straight up get a human right away, that might be the best experience for most people if that human knows all the answers to, to their question and doesn't have to escalate it to another uh, more knowledgeable person. Unfortunately, the, the truth is that it's very expensive to have enough people so that when you have search and all of a sudden a thousand people call you at the same time, that you have enough people to immediately take all the calls, right? And so it's just prohibitively expensive for companies. And so you either pay a lot more for the overall service slash product that you have, or company can, companies can deal with that, or you'll have to wait in line for a while. And so now most people compare and think, you know, these IVR systems, that's not actually AI. That's that's what we were also trying to replace by with an AI system where you just say what you want to say and what you want to do, and then just do it with the AI right away in a natural conversation. That's what we're striving for. And that's, I think, when people will hopefully probably like it more. Well, and, you know, half the problem is, authentication, right? It's like mm -hmm. you spend the first, you know, minute of the call trying to, for them to figure out who you are, right? That's right. So that's the first problem. And then once you, once you get to a human, then they're like, need to figure out who you are again. You're like, didn't I already give all this information? That's right. So there, there's some simple things that you can do on the integration and actually the handoff. And this is something that, that we think about a lot. We, we don't actually focus on trying to replace people. We try to make them more efficient. Yep. Uh, and in this particular case, it's actually very nice if a person on the other side of the phone doesn't have to like ask again for all your credentials. And in some cases, you might also have a mix of AI and people where people might hand it off. Uh, I am still uh, kind of dumbfounded and surprised that in the US, people just keep asking me for my credit card information. <laughs> and they're just like, random people, hey, you want to get some scuba diving gear? And they say, all right, now give us all your credit card information the way you type it into your commerce, you know, e-commerce platform to buy stuff with the security code, because you know, for a while the credit card number it was you know too much, and then they added the security code. Now people just ask for your security code also, and 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 you just can't get scuba diving gear and lots of other things uh, on like when you call somebody. I would much rather give all that information to an AI that just stores it in immediately encrypted in some database rather than give it to people to type it in or write it on some piece of paper that they just throw in the trash and then my credit card information is everywhere. So I think there are some use cases where it'll be good to have a handoff where you might also describe a problem and the AI will kind of extract what the important bits are and then actually hand those important bits over to a representative and a, and a person. And, and that person can just immediately get you the right answer versus like having to go through a bunch of back and forth trying to identify what your actual issue is because, you know, you might not know for complex problems. So this is in natural language processing called summarization, right? We try to summarize a longer document and it's an actual task that, that we do both pure and applied research on because it's actually one of the hardest and least solved and, and most useful NLP, natural language processing problems out there right now. So if you were, you know, if there was a room full of CIOs in here, which there are, just they're <laughs> at their own homes or at the gym or wherever, and you and they are sitting there saying, hey, we want to do, we want to start increasing our usage of NLP or, you know, voice enabled AI or wh what have you, but we kind of don't know where to start. Like, what would be your recommendation? Boy, um, and I know that's a loaded question because there's like a million answers to that. We yeah. can do another hour on it, but <laughs> that's right. Yeah, it highly depends, and that's maybe on a meta level. I think as soon as you're a large enough company that you probably have a CIO, I think it's important for that CIO to think about the AI problems that are very close to the core expertise 
of that company. So if you're in insurance, uh, you probably want to have a data science and AI team to really think about risk and how to measure it, identify it, estimate it, and, and so on. You ideally don't have to ask your data scientists and AI or machine learning researchers and practitioners to build a chatbot again, because there are companies whose number one and only priority is building that. And so likewise with voice, I think it'll be important to understand how important is it. If you're you know, a speaker company, then probably you should have your own voice team, right? Because that is very close, like inputs, outputs, of voice and sounds and music and so on. It might be something you want to own to some degree. If you're, on the other hand, a company that sells some physical good in the world uh, and manufacturing, and you have salespeople and they just need to keep their notes and you want to have a good data entry and a lot of clean data in your CRM so you can keep track of your business, then it makes a lot more sense to just rely on outside service for voice. So in that sense, voice is similar to a lot of other AI features like natural language processing, like computer vision. You always want to see what part is the core expertise of my company and then have the data scientists focus on that core expertise and then try to outsource and use tools and vendors and whatnot for the things that aren't core, but are still really important, like connecting to your customer. Yeah, and then how would you go back to kind of like the business unit and then be able to pitch those things so that it's, you know, it's not just a cost center? Because I know a lot of the, a lot of our listeners and the CIOs, when we, when we talk behind the scenes, are nervous about pitching risky initiatives to their leadership team, be like, oh, we're spending more money on this. Like, again, didn't we already do this three times? Like, it didn't work the first three times? Like, how do you look at like showing the value of, of something like this as it's not just kind of like a shiny object? Um, boy, also it kind of highly depends on, on the industry that you're in, right? If you're in agriculture or you're in agricultural machines, you really want to think about AI as, you know, the, the future of, of the whole industry. So I think it depends which industry you're in. There are some industries that will get majorly disrupted by AI sooner and others that just get, you know, somewhere between five to 40% more efficient. And if you're in the majorly disrupt category, like cars, you probably want to have a lot of funding yeah. on self-driving and driving assist features and so on. Because I can almost guarantee you that in the next couple decades at most, potentially much, much less, I like to give error bars on my estimates of the future, yeah. there will be major disruption and maybe the future one potential future could be that driving cars is similar to riding a horse. You do it for fun, but you don't do it because you have to get to work, right? Yeah. You, uh, and and I can see how that is a potentially better future, though I still hope that public transportation can also improve a little bit. But in the U.S., that's uh, questionable. But, you know, other countries have, have figured out, like, really reliable, efficient, convenient, and comfortable, and in some cases, even luxurious public transportation. But... Uh, if you're in that space, then, you know, you should really suggest risky initiatives and be the change that, that you see happening and that you anticipate. Now, you do want to think when, when you're in not the major disruption regime, but in a, the, the smaller efficiency regime, in the end, the more efficient companies are the ones who survive. And so you do want to think about the biggest bang for the buck, so to say, that you can get from AI. And in some cases, we do have to look very carefully and realize that not every AI project, just because it has AI in it, will have a big impact on that company, right? You do need to be very careful about where you look at the processes. And the processes that are most ideally suited for AI are those that are repeated many, many times. So sometimes when customers come to us and say, oh, I want to use this AI, then I ask them, well, do you have data to train that AI? And I feel like if there's zero training data, or you can only come up with like a few dozen examples of a, any kind of process that you might want to automate, then it's probably not a big enough process to actually automate it, right? There's a reason why companies like Google or Amazon and Facebook in a consumer space have spent so much money on AI because they have processes that are repeated almost billions and billions of times every day. And you just have to have AI for it. It's impossible for any human to do that. And we see similar things in marketing cloud where we can go through all tweets and measure the sentiment according to your brand, even if your brand is just shown in a picture, yep. but we can identify the logo that you have, identify the scene that your product is shown in, and we can show over time by looking at millions and millions of images. When people interact with your brand after that marketing campaign, the sentiment actually improved because we can also do automated sentiment analysis. And so there's just certain things uh, and, and processes that repeat so often that you have to have an AI, and then you want to look at 
the processes that are you know the most valuable and see if you can either improve human decision making with AI or automate uh, parts of that process. So that's one aspect. And then maybe another thought and tip for CIOs is to start small. Try to find a small team of a few, you know, five, 10, like one or two scrum teams, five, 10 capable people, and just build a prototype to showcase to people what's possible and that a certain use case or product is actually possible. And if you can prove it to yourself and to others on a small scale, then you can scale it out and try to really cover all the edge cases. So in some ways it's maybe standard lean startup technology like uh, yeah. methodology that that you see and hear about in the Valley. And, and in that sense, it's true that AI is just, it is a technology, it's a software, and we can use a lot of the good processes for innovation that we have from other kinds of software projects for AI as well. But I, I think that's a really great, really great point. I think that that's some of the things that we've heard as well as, you know, if you have a enterprise product and you're selling, you know, B2B and you're in you know, manufacturing or something like that, you know, you don't have massive, you know, you're not a consumer product that's doing, you know, a million transactions a month or something like that. Website volume is like, you know, we get 470 people visit our site every month or whatever. You just don't have that massive amount of information that you'd need to figure that out. And so if you want to go find an AI product, you could probably just get something off the shelf and it could probably solve the problems rather than hiring a really expensive team and fighting for talent and doing that sort of stuff. That's right. And a good example that's similar to what you just mentioned is Commerce Cloud, right? Where we have a recommendation engine that we have a lot of smart people work on for a long time. And Commerce Cloud, our you know e-commerce platform, is actually one of the largest in the United States. So it's kind of surprising to a lot of people because, of course, you don't go to Salesforce.com to buy your shoes. You go to Adidas.com, but they run on Commerce Cloud. And so, and many, many other companies do. And so all of these Commerce Cloud installations come with a recommendation engine that is very easy to use. And then it gives you know your customers recommendations for the right kinds of products given what they clicked on and what they've bought and so on. So those are sort of out of the box AI features that if you use the right vendor, you can make use of right away, even with a relatively small scale and without having to have a specific team for it. What do you think is the future of paramotoring? <laughs> um, I, I love paramotoring. For those of you not familiar with paramotoring, it's like paragliding or skydiving. You have a, a glider a, a shoot over your head uh, wing, but then you also in paramotoring you actually have a propeller uh, fan, <laughs> some people call it lovingly, um, have a propeller backpack. And so you can actually start launch from flat ground and fly up. And uh, I guess the future of paramotoring, uh, some people think is in battery powered paramotors, mm. um, which would be nice. But right now, unfortunately, the energy density and, and weight of batteries is just not quite as good, good enough compared to a little two stroke. For those of our listeners who haven't done it, which I assume most of our listeners have, we're a really adventurous group. <laughs> um, why, why should people try it? It's, you know, these magical dreams that you have of flying. Paramotoring is that. You can launch from any little field and then you fly, you can go up to 18,000 feet, which wow. is, I think, the maximum. Above that, it's uh, a, a airspace. And you can just fly at like three feet off the ground and fly along rivers and lakes and explore beautiful nature and just it's just an incredible perspective that you get from it and now every time i see a beautiful scenery i just want to fly over that <laughs> it seems like it's one of those like the closest thing to what people used to like draw in sketchbooks in like the mid 1800s of like yeah you can just you can just do this and you can fly and there's a fan on it and it blows and you can just figure out where you go. It is kind of incredible how simple it is. And you buy the gear once uh, and do proper training, ideally get certified. In the US, you actually don't have to. You can just find one on Craigslist, watch some YouTube videos. No kidding. Go try to kill yourself. Yeah. Not a good idea. USA. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Um, in, uh, in other countries, you have to have a full-blown pilot's license. But anyway, it's so fun, so beautiful. I have a bunch of pictures online if people are interested in it uh, on my Twitter. Yeah, I mean, I... Uh... I feel like there's a lot of folks that we've talked to that are like, you know, you can tell a pilot. They've oh. already told you they're a pilot. <laughs> I tried. I, it was you. You brought it up in my defense. <laughs> no, no, no. I know. Um, but I was. Uh, but it's funny. So we talked to a lot of people that are. I don't know. CIOs. Maybe they're they're thrill seekers. Um, yeah, spend a lot of I'm time sure in front of some. a computer. Yeah. You know. But I think it's it's one of those kind of like wonderful parts of technology of like like you said with earlier AI can beat you in chess a hundred times out of 100, but it's going to struggle. Uh, the robots are going to struggle to get your mail for you. You know, it's like that sort of thing, right? It's 
the complexity of these kind of like simple technology is pretty fun. And I guess last last thing on paramotoring, yeah, it is it is a con- nice combination between adventure, but also technology, right? You want to really be, like know about your motor, know about your wing, know about the physics of flight, know about the weather and nature, and you learn a lot about the weather because your life literally depends on you not flying in a really into a really bad weather situation. And they're not all as obvious as like, those are really bad, you know, clouds and thunderstorms. And so it, it teaches you a lot about the world and there's a new perspective on it. So Salesforce Einstein has done something like 4 billion predictions. Is that right? We're way past that. Way past that? Yeah. Okay, so way past that. And you've recently released the largest publicly available AI language model. Is that mm-hmm. correct? So what's next? I'll, I'll double click on this language model which because uh, I'm really excited about it. This is called Control CTRL. Uh, we published it and we open sourced the model and uh, it's gotten, uh, I think, already a thousand forks and stars combined on, on GitHub. And it's basically a model that trained with a very simple objective and that is to predict the next word. But with that objective comes then the ability to start a document and then have uh, this model, the control language model, actually autocomplete the text for you. And so you can say, for instance, I want to create a CNN article from 2003 where the UK prime minister meets the US president. And then it will just talk about George Bush meeting Tony Blair and generate that text and you you didn't say these were the people, the right people at the right yeah. time, but it has picked that up from reading billions of other documents and then got that knowledge. And then of course, it makes up other stuff that you didn't condition on. Uh, and when you change the date and the year, it will switch to the right president, UK prime minister in each year and so on. So it's really fascinating. What What is this useful for? Uh, some people are actually worried about undermining democracy and what it could, you know, generate fake other things. But I actually think that's a very unrealistic worry because everybody can just copy and paste a bunch of random text and say, oh, or, or make up stuff and write this. Somebody said X and, you know, you have I to I always think that too. Facts. I literally always think that when people are like showing these crazy things, I'm like, you know that humans can just, you can type on a computer anything and say this person said it exactly. and then tweet it, which people do all the time yeah. and like, you know, spread it misinformation. I think obviously not to under, you know, underestimate misinformation is a huge problem. It is but that being said, it's problem. like humans can just do that. We just not with like having a robot fake, create fake stuff is like just as, just as easy as a human. Um, right. So, so I don't see as many problems as others in this, but uh, what is interesting is you can actually also use this model and ask to create a more efficient marketing campaign. For instance, you can, if you're in, you have a certain message, you release a new product and you write a tweet about it in your marketing group, the model in the future can actually say, oh, write this in a more engaging way. And it'll change the text for you based on the semantics and the content that you gave it. You can also use this model, I think, to just listen in on service conversations and eventually start responding to those service conversations. So things that we just talked about with voice and so on, and you connect that, such a powerful language model to that, it can just kind of learn it by itself. And then as service agents start a new job, they can see what the AI would say, or in some cases type uh, when it's you know, over text, uh, over a website or over email, and just click on the autocompletes that the AI suggested and then get better or eventually change small things here and there as they get more and more knowledgeable than the AI that had listened to all previous service interactions in your company. And so I think it's a really powerful tool for for useful text generation. And it's called, sorry, say it's called? CTRL, uh, Controllable uh, Language Models. We'll link it up in the show notes as well for people want to check it out. So why'd you make it publicly available? because we think it's a good progress for AI in the field. It's actually very expensive to train such a large model, and we want to make it widely accessible for everybody. Uh, We don't want to have this kind of technology be in the hands of a few and instead empower others to, to build interesting things with it. So other than control, there are a bunch of exciting things happening right now. We're actually looking at summarization as a really important task. And in fact, it's the... Uh, one of the most impactful and least solved tasks in the field of natural language processing. And one big problem in summarization that we identified is the way it is trained. 
and the way that all these neural network models actually deal with proper nouns, for instance. So it turns out in deep learning and uh, neural networks, and which is basically now the underlying technology for all natural language processing models, all words are mapped to a list of numbers, a vector. And a list of numbers turns out, that list of numbers turns out to be very similar for first names. So Jason, Jeremy, and so on, John, they all get a similar list of numbers. And when you know that and you look at the summaries, you realize, oh, sometimes there's some really big mistakes. Uh, we saw some summaries of a news article about a shooting and it mixed up the teacher who helped end the shooting with the shooter. Mm -hmm. And so the name of the teacher became the name of the shooter in the summary. And it was you know, completely wrong. But the way summarization is evaluated is we look at n-gram overlap, how many words and phrases are overlapping between the original crown truth summary and the one that the model generated. And you can actually do quite well. You just mixed up two words, right? So 98%, 98 yeah. of the 100 words are correct. But it's a big difference yeah. about the factual correctness, right? And there are a lot of other issues in summarization. You can have in your summary, all facts are true, but it's still a terrible summary. I'll give you an example. Uh, it was a sunny day and uh, a plane crashed. And the summary is, it was a sunny day. You know, it's a factually correct summary, but it's it feels wrong. Or you can even say X tried to punch Y, and Y ran away, X caught up, and then Y punched X. Now, if you if the summary mixes up the order and starts with Y punched X, then it feels like Y was the aggressor rather than just defending uh, herself or himself, right? And so it's really important to get the order right and all of these different subtleties that matter very, very much for the factual correctness of summaries. And so we actually just today published a paper on tackling this particular problem in the field of summarization. So that's what's that's what's happening. And then, of course, there's a lot of connections to voice, but we'll have to wait for Dreamforce for some of those. Yeah, no kidding. Before. We will have to wait. Uh, Just three more weeks or so. And bated breath. Um, all right, let's get into the lightning round. These questions are going to be fast and easy. Just like the Customer 360 platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation for every experience. You can go to salesforce.com slash platform to learn more. We love Salesforce. Obviously, I mean, you you are the chief scientist, so of course you do. But for our listeners, uh, check them out. We love them and you will too. Lightning, fast questions. Richard, are you ready? All right, born ready. Number one, what app are you using on your phone that's the most fun? Can't be any Salesforce one, non-Salesforce app. Uh, Windy, it's a, a app to tell you about the weather and it tells you whether you can fly that day or not and where. Favorite book or podcast that you've read or listened to recently? Um, I'm currently really enjoying From Dawn to Decadence, 500 Years of Western Cultural Life. It's heavy. I've been chewing on it for a while, but it's a super fascinating book about 500 years of not like which king fought which other king, but like all the interesting intellectual ideas that led to our civilization as we know it now in the Western world. Favorite thing to cook or eat? Hmm, uh, some good California salad or or good sushi. Good sushi, so good. Salad can't be the favorite. Right? <laughs> you you should see my salads. They they weigh like two pounds. And oh yeah, a lot it's like, of good stuff in them. <laughs> I just learned yesterday. This is, sounds so silly, but I just learned that a wedge salad always has bacon and blue cheese. Is that true? And where have I, I been? That. Under a rock. Um, Favorite place, big traveler. So favorite place to travel. Ooh, I really love visiting Japan. Uh, it's such a just different culture, but so advanced in many ways and curiously different than others. And then also love nature a lot, uh, Death Valley National Park and just the California countryside where you have a lot of freedom to go into the middle of nowhere, paramotor, kayak, jet surf, uh, motorized surfboard, and, and various places. So I love, really, really love California. What is your, not a lot of these out there, but what is your best advice for a first time chief scientist? <laughs> All the many uh, first timers. Um, so it comes back a little bit to, I don't know if I can do that one really lightning fast. There's a lot, uh, <laughs> a lot yeah, to say there. Um, but I think really identifying the most important use cases for your company, identifying whether you're in that regime of major disruption for your entire company and the entire industry or field that you're in versus efficiency gains. And then where, depending on where you fall into that spectrum, really try to rally 
collect the data, uh, make sure you have a really good data stream and way to access it, get all the legal stuff out of the way, and then identify, given that data and given the processes that repeat a lot, where you can add the most value, and then ideally create positive feedback loops where as the AI makes a decision, from time to time, people will change that decision or have a say in it. And every time a human interacts with that AI system, that AI system should get better. And sometimes you have sort of the training is in batch or somewhere outside of that standard workflow. And that's rarely how AI will get really, really good and become an important part of the workflow of that company. What question do you never get asked that you wish you were asked more often? Well, you asked that paramotor question, so that was the first. <laughs> so uh, that was probably the closest one. Um, but uh, I think in terms of AI, sort of pitfalls, uh, things you can do wrong uh, with with AI, uh, focusing on sort of cute projects that that don't really have large impact on the important parts of the workflow in in the industry that you're in, making sure you have, you know, like uh, this sort of this this dirty secret that AI is only as good as the training data that you give it. And the fact is that a lot of time is spent on getting that data question right. And a lot of companies come to us and say, oh, Richard, saw this cool AI. We want to do some cool AI project. I'm like, okay, where's your data? And then the truth is that I don't hear back from many of them like for six plus months. Yeah. And then when they have the raw data, because they're properly digitized, they're probably collecting it, it's all in one place and not in five different places and like some SQL database here, some on-prem stuff there, some Word documents in that folder and so on. You have it all in one place, which, you know, putting my Salesforce hat on, a CRM is a good place for that. Uh, then, then you need to label it too. You need to actually go out and show it to a large enough group of people and you need to trust those people to label your data. And so helping our customers work through that life cycle and then actually infusing the AI at the right time and the right place in the workflow, these are tough problems to think about. And sometimes it's deceptively easy when we describe how we do it. And there's actually a lot of thought that goes into doing it well. I love that. Well, Richard, this has been awesome. Thanks so much for coming on. Uh, any final stuff to plug? Any, anything else? Uh, thanks so much for having me. Uh, check out our large language model and uh, look forward to seeing you all at Dreamforce. IT Visionaries is created by the team at mission.org and brought to you by the Salesforce Customer 360 platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Build connected experience, empower every employee, and deliver continuous innovation with the customer at the center of everything you do. Learn more at salesforce.com slash platform.